So let's talk about the blurb mistakes to avoid. I just realized I started really negative, didn't I? Here's what you shouldn't do with your blurbs. Usually I like to start more positive, but since this is a slide that came up, let's talk about blurb mistakes to avoid. And again, I wanna keep this quick so that we do have lots of time to workshop your blurbs. So confusing names, lots of proper nouns. The genres that really wanna pay attention to this would be like fantasy things or sometimes even historical things. Um, it can be really, really confusing. We always wanna make sure that people can very easily skim our blurbs and even the, um, the, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the act of having like multiple capitalized words in a row makes it harder to skim. Our eyes just aren't quite as used to that. And so like an example would be when Winston Marshall III, the Duke of Wellington Palace and heir of the crown jewel of Pythagorean visits his grandmother, the Duchess, you know what I mean? Like when you, when you got too many titles, too many places, proper nouns and names that people aren't familiar with, it makes it hard to skim and it makes it a little confusing. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. I, again, I think the kind of main genres to pay attention to that would be like fantasy or historical. Another mistake to avoid is just gonna be way too much summary of the book. Right, do you guys remember like seventh grade English class and your teachers would yell at you because in your book report, you just told them what happened and they were like, no, we want your reaction to what happened. Um, it's similar to that. Just don't, don't summarize the book. You really, you only want to give a teaser, right? It's um, for any Marvel fans out there. It's like the Endgame DVD trailer like revealed every single spoiler in the entire movie, which is okay because it was the DVD. But you don't want to do that like for your book. You don't want to tell them the entire everything. You don't want someone to be able to read your blurb and know exactly what's going to happen. The one, one part of this where it's a little bit more challenging, I think, is romance. Because romance, you know there's going to be a couple. You know their couple's going to encounter some kind of struggle. And then you know they're going to have a happily ever after. But even then, there are ways to leave some things to the imagination. How are they gonna overcome the, the struggle? Or maybe the struggle itself is what's a little bit of a teaser. You know, when they move into this new neighborhood, they have no idea what's waiting for them, things like that. So you definitely want um, not to summarize the whole thing and to make it so that people are like, oh, well, I could just, you know, you don't want your blurb to be the Cliff Notes version where people can be like, okay, now I know everything that's gonna happen. We already talked about paragraphs being, um, or you know, wanting things to be really easy to skim. Another thing that's going to make a, a ton of impact is just breaking up your paragraph. So, for example, let me show you. I was looking at one of my box sets that I haven't updated the blurb in a while. So let me pull it up so that I can give myself as an example of what not to do. All right. So. Um, this one, Kindle, All right? Do you see how it, like it's so boxy that it makes it very, very hard to skim, right? It's like paragraph after paragraph. And to be honest, like other things about this blurb are pretty okay. Like I, there are still some mistakes for sure. Like there's not an actual call to action and things like that. But it's not like in and of itself, not a bad blurb, but just the formatting is um, boxy. So let me show you what I'm doing kind of by contrast. Here's another box that I'll show you with a more updated blurb. Do you see how like this, first of all, it's a little shorter. I would say if anybody tends, if there tends to be one error more than another, people tend to make their blurb longer than it needs to be. So first of all, this is a little shorter, but even more importantly, like the paragraphs are really broken up. Right, it's so again, that makes it very easy for skinning. All right, questions or comments so far? Otherwise, we'll just go right back to the slide. To, oh, and, and this is um, also what I mean by the cluttered call to action. Let me go back to this one. So, this one didn't even have a call to action, it was just like, buy this book, and here's all the awards that this author has won. <laughs> all right, so there's no um. I mean, okay, so this is for the audiobook. Find out why listeners from blah, 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 blah are devouring this thought-provoking series, right? But the call to action gets crazy cluttered. So yes, technically, this is a small call to action. Find out why listeners like this book or readers like this book. But it's so cluttered with like all these lists 
with awards and things like that. Another thing that many authors do, if you do this and you love to do this and you have a reason to do it, go ahead and keep doing it. But I actually am not a fan of when your blurb you get all the way to the bottom of your blurb and then it's like, oh, and here's the title of every single other book I've ever written. Or here's the list of all the other books in this series. Because basically, by the time they get, let's get to a more optimized blurb. By the time they get to a more optimized blurb, you want, to, you want the first line to hook them in, all right? Deep in the heart of Alaska, there's more to feel or fear than just the cold. You wanna have a really strong call to action at the very bottom where you're telling them specifically to buy this book, <clears throat> and then what some authors do is they, they like put a new line and they say things like all books by Alana Terry, or they just, they shove a ton of reviews in there at the very bottom where it's just like a review dump. Things like that kind of diffuse the momentum, right? So you've got your hook. If people like the hook, they're going to read the rest of here. By the time they get to your very clear call to action where you're telling them to buy it, Basically, you don't want them to spend any more time thinking. You want them to go right from buy the Alaskan Refuge three book box set and dive into a world of breathtaking and unforgettable adventure today to buy now with one click. Like that's what you want them to do. If I had down here other books by Alana Terry, you might also like. First of all, that takes away the momentum, and then it gives them so many choices that they can be like, oh well, maybe I don't want to buy this book. Maybe I want to buy her other book. And sometimes, like this is what I don't love. This is a problem that once you get like prolific with dozens of titles, I don't love like when you just go to someone's author page, like look at this, where do you start? Who knows where to start, right? And so it's very easy if someone just says, oh, I love this author, you've got to read her books. And all they do is they go to this page. There's going to be so many choices. It's like, well, I have no idea. And so they're like, okay, never mind. I'll come back to this when I feel like making a hard decision. So you want to make it really, really, really easy for them to go from reading your blurb to um, just clicking that buy now button. So my opinion is that having lots of stuff after the blurb about your book is gonna diffuse the momentum. Like I said, some authors really like putting the lists of series out and things like that. I'm never going to like wag my finger at you for doing that. If you like to do it and you have a reason for doing it. If you're doing it just because someone else told you to, here is an invite to kind of reconsider that. All right, questions. Um, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Alana, I have a question. Uh, that yeah. You have some great formatting here with bold and italics and all that. For some reason, I get uh, my formatting for my descriptions it turns out terrible. Do you have certain uh, techniques or a site you use? Mm -hmm. I do. I have both. Let me pull up. And then Tony, I see your question, we'll get to that next. All right, so we can, um, we can do a super quick, there's a couple ways you can get it formatted. I'm gonna see if I can just pull up the blurbs. Here's also in ReaderLink, they have a nice tool, but again, ReaderLink is a paid service if you don't buy ReaderLinks just so that you've got access to this. But let me at least show you how it works in ReaderLink. And then um, I believe in here, let's just log in real quick. I believe there's um, a section in this course you have that also walks you through ways to do it. Let me see. Uh, formatting your blurb. Okay, so that would be one video that you could watch. Um, Here's how you do it in Reader Links. It's the Amazon description tool. And again, just because I'm doing it in Reader Links doesn't mean you need Reader Links to do it. Um, I'm just going to show you kind of some of the rules. All right, so um, you do not need to be like crazy into coding or things like that, but here's just a few things to know. Um, what are these called? These aren't carrot uh, greater than less than. I'm sure in coding world, there's another name from. So basically like, Alligator mouth be alligator mouth. Here's my hook. And then to close it, to tell the code that you want to be done being bold, you just do a backslash B and then close it again. Um, why isn't it showing? Oh, here's my hook. Okay. So 
you write it this way, and then the only thing that Reader Link does is it kind of shows you a preview. Um, so here's the ones you want to know. You want to know BR gives you paragraph break. Putting two of them is going to make it so that you've got double spaces between your between your things. Um, so I don't need to hit paragraph here. So then here's my hook. Maybe I want to do italics now. So it's the same thing. It's these brackets with an I for italics. This is my italic part. And then to close it again, backslash I. Those are really the only ones that I use. I use bold, italics, and breaks. Again, BR, BR. You should buy this book. All right, so you can do this like right into KDP. I just like doing it in reader links because it gives you the preview. But there are going to be other ways where basically you just want to find something like there's something called W3 School. There are ways where you can type it in in code and just get a live preview of what it looks like. The other one that works pretty well for doing that is on Author Central. They make it pretty simple to do the formatting. I like doing it on there as well. So let me show you real quick on Author Central. Um, so let's see, book. Let's go to this book. All right, so under product description, you can go to edit. You can just write it and then do things like bold and italic. Um, that's what I would recommend. And then you can click edit HTML. And this is what you would copy and paste in your PDP um, description. These are the two ones that I recommend. Um, all right, let me go back to Tony's question. I thought the book lists were for KU readers to see you have a series. Do you offer a book list on your website? And then I use a blurb and my formatting is still off. Yeah, some of the um, some of the ones that are thrown around for using them, the formatting still for some reason doesn't get accepted by KDP. So I would recommend using this one here on Author Central or Reader Links or just remember basically the only thing to remember how to do bold, um, paragraph break, and italic. All righty. Um, okay, so Tony's talking about the KU. Book list. Yeah, like I said, if you if you like having the list there and you find that it's useful for the readers and things like that, you definitely can keep doing it. What I like to do, because you're right, there are many readers who want to know that it's a series. The way I like to let people know it's a series, let's see if I've done it well. <laughs> I don't remember. It's been a little bit. Some of my um, things aren't quite as updated as they would be. What I would do is just mention in the books. Oh, you know what? I know how we can do it. I know one that's done well for that. Okay, here's book one in a series. All right, so hook, pull them in, a uh, strong call to action, but I also let people know that it's a series. You might not be able to read just one, Edge of Your Seat novellas. It's the first novella in this series. Here's what the series is about. So I would prefer to intersperse it organically that this is a series, and you can even do this. You know, this is the first book in the series. And then also, you know, readers are really used to just going to the series page, clicking on that, and being able to see it. So again, that's why I don't have the list. I know some authors like it, and if you like it and have been doing it and want to keep doing it, perfect. Um, just I wanted to give people another option so that they don't feel like that's the only way to do it. All righty. Um, thank you, Julia. Julia has another recommendation for a book description generator. This one is a free one. So in chat, you can find that link. So again, you write your description. You can bold, italicize things. You generate the code. So here we go. This is a great book. And I want this part to be bold and these two words to be italic. And then I go to generate my code. Here's my code. Um, for some reason, sometimes when I have tried the Kindle Preneur version and put it in KDP, it didn't work for me. It told me that I had like coding errors and I don't know about, enough about coding to know what needed to be fixed. But um, perhaps if you're just doing it real simply, this would be totally fine for you as well. And they also have you know, a couple other cool things. Um, 
I wouldn't go overboard with these symbols and things like that. I also, I would worry about putting like a five star character in there. Just do a tiny bit of research because um, I know every so often Amazon will crack down on certain things. And if I remember right, like over the top, things like that were one of them that they might have cracked down on, but I, I don't know that. So you might want to research. All righty. Um, all right. Mary's thrown in a book link. So how about this? If you want to workshop one of your blurbs live here, go ahead and throw it in the chat now. I think I've got like one or two more things to cover. Um, okay, Julie says, I know why that happens. You have to make sure you don't have any spaces after the end line. Go in and delete all of those before hitting generate. Perfect. Thank you. That's I'm sure what I did. Um, oh, here's one more real quick formatting tip that I noticed. Sometimes the previews of your books are, are not going to show the breaks. So your blurb looks great here, but like for example, if I were to share this description on Amazon and Amazon pulled the preview, it's not going to put you know, a paragraph break here. And so what that would look like is this. So sometimes, um, a good habit to get into is just before your paragraph break, put one extra space. And Julie, maybe that's exactly what you're telling me not to do. If so, let me know. This is what I do so that when they pull, you know, so I'll still have it, um, I'll still have it as a all right, separate paragraph in my description, but should Amazon like shorten that description for me, I still have a little space here. All right. You guys can tell this is not like my strongest. This is the extent of like, you know, HTML stuff that I know and get into. So I'm, I'm really sorry if I've made it more confusing for you guys. Um, all right, back to here. All right, here is just kind of your blurb checklist. Here's the things that like, if someone sends me a blurb to critique, here are the things I'm looking for. Um, want to make sure it's got a hook. And again, that it's um, super skimmable. You want to throw in your genre keywords throughout the blurb. What I mean by genre keywords are just the things that are going to attract the readers in your genre. So let's say you write mystery. Those genre keywords are probably going to be things like, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> twist, suspenseful, um, never saw it coming, detective, you know, um, those kinds of words for romance. This is a, a good example. Like there are so many genres of romance that you can really narrow down and nail down your genre with these keywords. So like for some genre sub, or, sorry, some romance sub, sub genres, your keywords are going to be things like sweet, heart rom heartwarming, small town, friends. Like you're going to have those words in there. Whereas for others, it's going to be like steamy, um, hot, spicy. You know. Those are the kinds of words that are going to clue in your readers to know if this is the kind of book they're looking for. Um, all right, so focus more on the characters and the experience in the plot. So this is just a nice rule of thumb to avoid plot summaries. So basically, like for every sentence you spend talking about the plot, you should spend like one or two sentences, like at least two sentences talking about um, the characters and the reading experience. By reading experience, I'm talking about um, what the reader's going to come away with. So that's why we say things like, you know, dive into this heart pounding series or, you know, fall in love with these small town couples, things like that, that are going to kind of get your readers in the. Uh, if your blurb can get the reader picturing themselves, reading your book and loving your book, you've really nailed down you know what I mean by talking about the experience. Oh, Sharon can't see my screen. Let me know if other people are having that problem. Um, you want to pique people's curiosity. So this is again why you don't want to tell the entire, you know, three part act with every single like minor subplot. Um, sometimes you can avoid subplots altogether. They you know, not every single subplot and every single character should be introduced in your blurb. Um, and you want to make it so that 
people after reading your blurb, they want to uh, need to know more, right? Because if, if you pique someone's curiosity and you don't satiate their curiosity, they're just going to be like, I need to know what, what's going on here. Again, that's, that's the goal. This really plays out in more of the like suspenseful type genres, um, but really in any of them, you want to leave enough um, questions unanswered that readers are going to buy your book in order to resolve those questions in their head. And then again, a super, super clear call to action at the end, which we talked about. So let's go into your um, examples here. So again, give me your Amazon links when you're ready for me to take a look at them. I'll pull them onto my screen and we'll take a look at them. All righty, whoops. That's not what I want in. Okay, hold on. I'm, I'm looking at these in incognito just because otherwise it really messes up my like browsing history when I go to log on to Amazon. It's kind of funny. All right. This is Mary's. Uh, which book on here do you want me? Okay, Mary says she's losing read through on seven and nine. So do you want me to look at number seven, Mary? Yes, please. Cool. All righty. Um, I don't know what's going on. This whole page looks different. They're changing things up all the time. All right. Uh, first of all, great cover. Love the um, the sky, things like that. The genre is super clear with the romance. Lightning and storms leads me to believe there might be some kind of uh, some kind of suspense. You know, even if it's not, it doesn't look romantic suspense. I don't think that's what you write anyway, but definitely leads me to think there's more than just more than a, something going on. All right. Staying true to yourself is difficult when doing so hurts someone else. I think the, uh, what's we're not looking for, the gist behind that is a great hook. The way it's written is slightly confusing. I wonder if there's a way that we can kind of condense that. So staying true to yourself is difficult when doing so hurts someone else. I think this is a dilemma that many people can relate to. Um, but the way it's written is slightly confusing. Um, maybe even like posing it as a question, what do you do when staying true to yourself hurts the one you love most or something like that? Okay. Right, Jordan Shepard has regrets, big ones. When she makes a seemingly rash decision which may cost her everything, she must come face to face with her family and start rebuilding her life. So a good job here in that you didn't, um, you didn't tell me everything about Jordan. You know, you're not like, Jordan Shepard is a, that's another kind of blur mistake to avoid. Don't right. start introducing your character with like a noun. Jordan Shepard is a hairdresser, right? We want to know more than that. So great job introducing her in a way that arouses that curiosity. Um, so she makes this rash decision. Now, the one thing you're slightly at risk of, Mary, is, um, readers don't want to hate your character and if she's like if she's doing something selfish and detrimental like if she truly is putting her needs above everybody else around her um that's going to be a put off like is that the kind of character she is or is this truly like an honest mistake that well this is my this is my suggestion never ever try to rehab a character after you've made her a villain in the previous book <laughs> yeah okay got so, it you know that's that would hard. be hard but um in this case she quits her job when her boss is just horrible to her and then has to okay. go back home to her brother who she's estranged with uh because she was a jerk so she has to go and apologize okay, and okay. So maybe, maybe we could find a way to make sure she sounds slightly more sympathetic. That would be my only, my only suggestion here. All right, Christiana Romero knows a little bit about starting over after a catastrophe. She's trying to make it as an on-air talent covering the X Games, yet he still has the heart of a competitor. When he crosses paths with Jordan, he finds himself wanting to compete in a whole new game. I like that. That's a cute kind of pun. Um, I would love... I'm going to assume that most of your readers are not like crazy into X games. 
And so I would tease out this part. What, what is this catastrophe? Like you mentioned the catastrophe and then all of a sudden you just say, yeah, and he spends his life playing video games. Like that's what it sounds like in the, right. um, and so like tease out the catastrophe side of things. But I really, I like this, this cute pun. All right. Christiana is the type of man Jordan never thought she'd find. He hopes, oh, he loves her despite her differences. She fears love may not be enough when she chooses to forge a bold path of her own. That sentence was a little bit jumbled. Um, maybe again, maybe we could throw in some questions. Is love going to be enough or something like that? Can Jordan and Christiana come to grips with the path not taken and begin a life together? I like that. All right. If you love workplace romances, you will adore this clean and wholesome romance with a touch of suspense. Oh, I was right. Touch of suspense. Okay. <laughs> Slightly redundant here. So how about if you love workplace love stories with happily ever afters, you will adore this clean and wholesome romance or something like that. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, this is smart. This is a good way to kind of bridge that gap that we were talking about with you don't need to list every single book, but you still want to mention that it's a series and where it is in the series. There's a way that you can even incorporate this into your um, call to action. So I would say like something like this. If you love workplace romances, um, read Half Not Taken, comma, the eighth novel in the hidden beauty in the state, something like that. That's a little bit of a mouthful. But you know, you could leave it just like this, but I would try to work it in. Let me show you more of an example. I think that will be better. Let me see if I still have descriptions up. Got too many links up. I don't need that one. Uh, this is the one I was looking for. So going back to something like um, like this novella series I was showing you, there's a way to mention that it's a series. If there's a way to mention which book it is in the series, there's a way to tie in even the series, I'm sorry, the genre keywords while you're talking about the series while still having it kind of flow organically. It's kind of like the, um, the person who just finds a way to insert into a conversation the fact that she's single, right? Like she doesn't have to work hard to fit it in. She just slips it in. That's one way that you can handle this. I don't think you need to, but um, if you wanted to, that would be the way. So let me oh, go back let me go. Here. Those are some suggestions. Does that kind of give you a, a place to start, Mary? Yeah. Um, and what's your feeling? Um, I'm noticing more authors are doing this in terms of putting like a clean and wholesome romance in their subtitle. Um, I think it's pretty smart because, yeah, the one thing you want to, in order to adhere to Amazon's letter of the law, you want to make sure that the subtitle does appear on your cover. So let me show you how I do it. I like it because it makes it searchable. And it also gives people like a really clear idea of what they are. So let me, let me show you here. A Turbulent Skies Christian Thriller Book One. I've gotten that written here on the cover as well. Um, so actually this is not, a, I didn't do this as a subtitle. I just made this my series name. That yeah, is a series a name, A Turbulent Skies Christian Thriller. Um, so in your case, what you could do is just change change the name of your series to hidden beauty sweet romance or something like that that would be a way to get those keywords in there okay yeah all righty thank you mary let's see who's up next all righty let's go to xena's metropolis a fantasy adventure yeah similar here. Um, all right, Eritrea, prostitute of civilization, home to a hundred gods, jewel of the desert, city of the dead, necropolis. Okay, this, Zena, it's, it's for me, and I'll, I'll mention right at the beginning, I don't read much fantasy, so if there are fantasy fans here, feel free to unmute and give your suggestions. In my mind, this is just a bunch of names that kind of confirms my bias that fantasy is confusing <laughs> again it's some of that's going to be my my own bias but even for fantasy readers i'm going to guess that we could find you a better hook all right so let's see what you've got next oh and one thing just with the formatting i would encourage you to do the double paragraph break 
because again, that just makes it a lot easier to skim. All right, in an ancient desert city where the spirits of long dead rulers rustle through the winding streets, a prison guard is forced to save the life of a young priest whose lost memory holds the key to the fate of two cities. Okay, that's a lot of exposition. I think that what, what to me stands out as a real key that we can lean into is somebody's lost their memory, but that memory has the key to like the survival of the world. Basically, if you could find a way to lead with that, <coughs> excuse me, right now you're leading with, it's an ancient desert city. Okay, that's a lot of fantasy. <laughs> and then a lot of exposition about the city. And then here's this prison guard and a priest. And now we get to the interesting part. Okay, he's lost his memory and that's the fate of the two cities. So I would, I would find a way to make this lost memory part of the hook. All right, Conier, prison guard, hearted by the betrayals and destruction of a past lore, drew a young holy warrior sent to Eritrea on a mission that has been wiped from his mind after brutal assassination attempt. Gylus, an ex-councilman and priestly initiate, he schemes to restore his power and punish the man who caused his imprisonment. Val, desperate for a better life, this young mischief maker finds himself surrounded by awakening legends and the fulfillment of prophecies. Become entangled in the web of political rivalries, sorceress intrigues, Headlong adventure and deep emotion, that is Necropolis. I really like this part. Become entangled in the web of political rivalry, sorcerous intrigue, and headlong adventure. I think that's a really good thing. Intelligently written, exciting to read, and memory haunting fantasy. All right, so what I would do, I think your review is good, but again, it's probably better to end with a, a stronger call to action. So I would end with become entangled, dot, 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 in deep emotion, and buy Necropolis now. Like, make it really, really clear. Um, move this up. Let's find a way to get this lost memory into the hook. Because right now, it sounds like your hook is the setting. And I know some people do read fantasy for, like, the world building and the setting and things. Um, but... Readers of fantasy are going to expect an exciting world. Um, so I would lead with the part that makes this different from fantasy, which is this lost memory. So um, something like, you know, his, his lost memory holds the key to the fate of the world, something like that. I don't think you need these things here. Um, I don't. I don't love just this list of characters. Like it's okay, it gives you, it definitely gives you a sense of like the tone, the feel. So in that part of it, it's okay. It's just, it doesn't quite flow. And that might just be because it's more of a list, right? Um, and so maybe remember the rule of thumb that for, you wanna spend as much time like building up the reading experience as you do like expositing about the characters and the plot. So I would say maybe we could, Keep it simpler. We don't need to know the names of all of these people. Like this, this whole section where you're introducing these characters, this could probably get turned into one paragraph. Uh, we don't need to know their names. So you could even just say, meet a prison guard haunted by the past, a holy warrior um, who's seen too much, and a young mischief maker uh, who's obsessed with prophecies. Something like that, doing things in groups of threes always has kind of an aesthetic and satisfying appeal. So maybe just have one paragraph devoted to some of the characters you're gonna meet. Um, something like that. Those are a few things that I would recommend. Does anybody else, especially if you're more familiar with fantasy, have suggestions for Zena? Or Zena, do you have any questions on that? Um, no, it's, that's really good advice. I appreciate it. Cool. All righty. Well, let's go to Tony's now. I hope it goes without saying, but I'll go ahead and say it anyways. Like, it's really hard for me um, to not be like, yeah, everybody, you're doing great, because I, I try to be very positive. So if I am not giving you as much positive feedback as you want or need, please know that it's just so that we can get to everybody's, and I know you're here for the critique side of it. So um, hopefully, again, that goes without saying. All right. 
Susan, Love Happens, a small town romance. Yeah, so this is a good example. It's super clear what we're looking at here. Um, super well branded, nice cover. Let's look at the blurb. She fell from a ladder right into a fake proposal. Okay, that's a, a fun, it arouses your curiosity. Um, it has a, an element of humor there to this step up to true love. It's got a little bit of a pun. I think it's, this is a cool hook, it works well. All right. Divorcee Hannah Jenkins is determined to create a bright new start for herself. I like that because readers like um, readers like knowing that characters are not sitting around feeling sorry for themselves, right? That's the other thing. Even if you've got a character who like has horrible tragedies befall them, which if you know if we didn't have characters like that, literature would be insanely boring. But readers also want to know that your um, your protagonist is not going to be sitting around whining about their lot. So this, this does a good job showing her determination. She's ready to start over. Here we go. All right, a small town gossip about the B&B owner's single mother status turns ugly when she discovers her young son being bullied. Okay, that was slightly confusing for me. Um, I did not realize until I kind of sat and thought about it that she is the B&B owner and single mother. So um, I think it'd be cool to mention the B&B. I think that's a fun appeal and it kind of fits with the feel of this kind of like sweet romance, but maybe we can add that later. So maybe um, Divorcee Hannah Jenkins is determined to start, make a new start. Small town gossip um, turns ugly when her single mother status impacts her son, something like that. We want to know, yes, a mother would hate to know that her son is being bullied because she's a single mom. Um, that's going to hit moms in the gut. So we want to just find a way to make this a little bit more clear. Although her fortune may improve when an accident drops her into the strong arms of the most eligible bachelor. All right, millionaire Adam Cade has everything but a family. In search of a loving marriage, a corporate superstar returns to his hometown only to be ambushed by gold diggers. Okay, so here's another, um, Another thing that works well, you don't say Adam Cade is a millionaire corporate superstar, right? You work that into here, all right? So millionaire Adam Cade has everything but a family. This is why we care about him. Um, all right. Finding common ground with the delightful woman he rescued from a fall, he agrees to a pretend romance. Oh, he agrees to pretend romance to solve both their problems. Cute. Okay. So they spend time together. They discover their brilliant ruse is developing to something very real but neither expect meddling townsfolk and personal insecurities to make a perfect match. Will Hannah and Adam Sherrod collapse or drive them into a pairing meant to last forever? Sweet Beginnings is the first book in the Enchanting Love Happens Sweet Romance series. If you like charming characters, destined passions. That was a little confusing. That um, doesn't sound like a vernacular. And clean, small community stories, and you'll adore Susan Warner's heartwarming tale. I should be getting to watch two hearts and trying to do. Okay, so this is a good example of kind of mentioning the series, mentioning where it is in the series without having to have the entire list. That's <laughs> Below. <super> strong <laughs> call to action here. Yeah, I, I still, if you're, if you're not like emotionally attached to having them there, I I'm would not. take them out. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Because this, it ends really strong. I mean, you don't get a stronger buy my book you know, than this. And then it's like, oh, well, maybe I want to read Sweet Attractions or so on. Oh, okay. um, here's the other thing that got confusing. This says it's the first book, but mm. here it says book two. Yes. So, you, yeah, might just need to go and change that up. Um, let me see if I can come up with any, what you could do. Let me go back. It's always nice to see what comes above the read more. Okay. That's fine. No, I think it's. I think it looks really good. Um, strongest recommendation would be to get rid of this. There were a couple things I highlighted that you know were a little convoluted sounding, but mm -hmm. I think all in all, it's it's real strong. So I wrote this this blurb, and I try to use again. I I use my blurbs for um my ads, and for whatever mm -hmm. reason, it's it just doesn't seem to do well. You know what I bet the reason is, is on Facebook, where you're running these blurbs as ads, 
the Facebook ad copy tends to be a more conversational style. And this really is just a straight up, this is a classic book blurb. Um, whereas Facebook, people are focusing more on having it sound like you're a friend talking about a book you just read. So do you, do you kind of understand the difference? Um, I think as a blurb, this works great, but I'm not surprised it's not serving you fabulously as a Facebook ad. What I would do, I would, you can definitely cut and paste parts of it for your Facebook ad. Um, I love this. She fell from a ladder right into a fake proposal. I think that's a really cool lead. And then what I would do, if for your blurb, you want to spend like at least 25% of your space talking about the reader experience, I would say in a Facebook ad, it could go up to like 75% is talking about the reader experience. So what I would do is try that hook. So I think it's, it's a fun hook that's going to appeal. Um, and then I would not, I, I skip over most of this and I would just, you know, have one or two short paragraphs that talk about this funny ruse without the classic meet Hannah in paragraph one, meet Adam in, in paragraph mm. two. I would have it be a little bit more kind of conversational. And then I would really emphasize just those genre keywords. This is a heartwarming, sweet romance. It sounds like there's some humor in it. Um, it's about people overcoming small town, small mindedness. I would focus on those things more so than uh, the, the plot. It's also, it's a little hard to send traffic, to send cold traffic to a sales page for a book too. It definitely can work, but it's a little harder. So that would be another, um, just another thing. Okay, because I know I put my chapter, if I put the chapter one in, it's fine. But I really want to get my mm -hmm. blurbs to start converting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think, honestly, as a, as a sales page blurb, I think it's real strong. I think the reason it's not working well as a Facebook ad is because the Facebook ads tend, it comes across as a little bit stiff and formulaic it's and that's what you kind of want for your blurb especially for romance where there truly is just um there's a straight up formula that you follow um so it hits the romance blurb i think the reason it's not working well on facebook is it's actually a little bit too formulaic um i would so for everybody writing your blurbs or this is what i'm going to encourage you to do tony for coming up with your facebook copy a, a great question to get yourself into the right mindset is to just picture your most rabid fan telling his or her best friend why they love your book and why they've got to read your book. That's especially on Facebook since it is just this social platform. That's the kind of tone you want to have there. Like, oh my gosh, this book was so cute. It was heartwarming. It made me laugh. Those are the kinds of things that you would want to emphasize in your Facebook ad copy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Awesome. All righty. Let's see how many more we've got. One. All right. So we'll finish up with the links we have and call that good. So we are up to Sharon's now. Sealed at Sunset. In love with his best friend's girl, Sunset Seals, book one. All righty. Um, seals don't touch. Seals don't poach on another team. Guys, girl, wow, that that was hard for me to read. I think maybe because um, all of these, so many of these were capitalized. I think that's partly why it doesn't skim read quite as well. So that's something you can consider. All right, seals don't post on another team, guys, girl. Tell me, anybody listening, does poach on? Is that a common phrase? Like, does everybody know what that means, or is that slightly confusing? Um, I, I get the gist, like, don't, you know, she's my girl, don't mess with her. The language felt a little strange to me. So let me know if other people feel similar to that. All right. Maybe I, feel Andrew Carr needs a, yes, please. I get it um, because maybe okay. because learn it's, it's more common, but um, I've also heard my teenagers use it, so. Okay, perfect. All right. We'll, we'll call it good then. All right. Navy SEAL Andrew Carr needs a lot of mindless speech time as he comes home from his first deployment. 
All right, he visits a friend he met in BUD slash S. Okay, I don't know what that is. So if you're if you're trying to appeal maybe to just military readers and you know that military readers are gonna know what that is, then you might I be do. fine. It's pretty standard for okay. a book, buds. It's got buds. Cool. Perfect. Okay, so you guys, yeah, you can tell this isn't um, a subgenre I'm as familiar with. But yeah, if, if your readers are gonna know it, it's perfect. At a small Florida coastal town, but what he finds is something you cannot have another Seal Brothers girl. Okay, here we go to the read more. Amy Greer is running from the stress in her life and knows the beat in the arms of her hot new boyfriend to do the trick. But when Andrew Carr comes to visit, she's not prepared for the explosive chemistry that develops between them. Okay, so this, this one you can tell I'm in more familiar territory here. I didn't stumble over any of the words. All right, when Carr is forced to defend her from her past, she realizes she's found the one she's been searching for her whole life. Okay. So other than just the fact that I'm not familiar with like seal terminology and that confused me in this first paragraph, I think you really spelled out the um, the dilemma. Well, now what I'm going to expect more, I'm going to expect more down here. I'm going to expect, um, I'm going to expect the fact that this is someone else's girlfriend to be the main issue. So I would love to see You've introduced character one, you've introduced character two. I get why the dilemma is going to happen, but I would love that spelled out more, right? So um, they've got this attraction, they've got this chemistry, they seem to be totally made for each other. He's defending her from her past. Oh, but by the way, there's this major problem because he's going against this like code of seal brothers, right? Um, so I think what I would do is I would, so you introduced character one, you introduce character two. Here is where I would really um, spell out the dilemma and the problem. And then what I would recommend is that you end with um, a real strong call to action. Uh, a nice format for those is the, if you like this, this, and this, then you'll love Sealed at Sunset. So if you love, you know, Navy Seals, Alpha Men, Best Friends, Goal Story, you know, I don't know the terminology for this, but, you know, again, use, putting things in groups of three, again, there's, there's an aesthetic to it. Um, so if you love teal romances, beach settings, and explosive chemistry, something, you know, pick your three things. Um, buy Sealed at Sunset for a um, something, something adventure today, you know, a uh, spicy seal adventure or whatever, you know, whatever those terms would be. So I think that we're doing great introducing the characters. Now I would love to have the dilemma introduced more and drawn out more and then ending with a real clear call to action. How does that I sound? I realize, I realize I had no call to action and now I'm going to right, go right, right. all my blurbs. I wonder how many times I've done that. Probably <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Duh. Of course. Yeah. But the very well, and here's another. Okay, great. Here's a time saving tool. Once you find a call to action for like book one in your series, it's going to be fairly easy to adapt that to the other books in your series. Right. You don't need to totally reinvent everything. So for example, let me pull up some of my Alaska books because I think I probably just um adapted the call to action for most of these. Hmm. Maybe not. But yeah, once you, like, basically, this is book one in the series, I could adapt this pretty easily for the call to action for the other books in the series. Readers aren't going to be like, oh, no, did you notice that she's got the same language in her blurb? Like, they're not, they're not really paying attention to that. So when you find a strong call to action that works well, it's fine to use a, a real similar call to action for the rest of the books in that series, you know, and just tweak a few things. Mm -hmm. Great. All righty. Absolutely. Let's go to Julie's. Hello, Julie. Um, where are we? There we are. Paste your link in. Boone, Diamond Ridge, Mountain Man, book one. An alpha mountain man, a sweet and sassy, curvy, younger woman in solo romance. Okay, that felt tiny bit like a keyword dump. I think you're at risk of um, 
tiny bit too many just adjectives in a row. All right, Daisy, I need a few more pictures from my nature book, but soon I'm lost in the woods and there's a bear with a belt buckle. I love it. <laughs> this is no bear, this is a beast of a man. I'm sorry, that was really funny. All right, Boone, I wanted to check my traps before the snowstorm, but then she faints and I'm stuck taking her home. What will I do with her? The real question is what won't I do to her? If you like steamy, happily after short stories with rough around the edges guys and sassy, competent women, then this book is for you. No cliffhangers and no cheating. Interesting. I did not know that that was something that was um, a sell point, but I can see how, yeah, if people don't like cheaters. <laughs> that's cool. All righty. Um, really, like, this was hilarious. I would, I would find a way to, like, take this same, this is what this book is and find a way to work it in a little more organically. Um, do all of your books have this split, um, like here's him, here's her? Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, so if that's kind of your format, I would maybe find a hook, even if you want to, again, find a hook that's gonna work for all of them. I would just find one that reads a little bit more clearly. Again, we've got tons of proper nouns, it just, it doesn't skim easily, and it doesn't easily lead me into the next line. So the main job of your hook is to get people to want to read the next line. Um, and again, this just felt like a, a bunch of words <laughs> thrown together. But I think that these, these were very cute synopses of their two POVs. I think readers are going to like that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else really. I mean, you could you could draw out a tiny bit of this, but honestly, like you're you're kind of appealing to the um, quick impulse readers anyway. So honestly, I think that this is this is going to serve you really well. If anything, I would work on not having this just be um, such a long string of words. Find a way to make it more of a sentence or phrase or you know hook. Um, even something like uh, sassy, curvy women meet, you know, hot alpha men in the Diamond Ridge series, something like that. You know, if you wanted to just kind of keep it simple and keep the same thing, having it be at least, you know, one verb in here would help. So, you know, sassy, curvy women meet something alpha mountain men. You know, something like that might be worth a try. All right, we're getting close to the hour, so I'm going to dive right into, I think this is our last one. All righty. All right, Melanie says they've gotten a thing that Amazon isn't respecting reviews for their product right now. It is a bummer. Sometimes they do just kind of, um, what's what I'm looking for? Yeah, sometimes they're they're going to do that too. There's not going to be a ton of re rhyme or reason. You've got good reviews and a decent number, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. All righty. I am in every rainbow, every raven and rainbow you see. We'll see each other again before you know it. It's time for me to sleep now. Good night, mommy. It's time to take a night. All right. July, 15-year-old swallowed a bottle of painkillers and closed her eyes. Someone said she took her life, but it could be more often said that she took her life back. Vanessa, the mother, tells the story of her daughter's incredible battle with painful chronic conditions and her unwavering commitment to be a voice for social justice. All righty. The pain of losing a child, the relentlessness of an incurable disease, and the ongoing spiritual relationship of mother and late daughter. Amidst devastating circumstances, teach us how to triumph spiritually when everything else is lost. Okay. Um, man, this is going to absolutely hit people in the gut. And if that's your intention, you totally did it. Some people would choose to make it a little bit softer um, for things like, you know, the same spirit that has people put in trigger warnings, things like that. Some people choose, though, if, if the whole book is going to be a punch in the gut and you need to know that going into it, go ahead and, and keep that in there. Um, this part was a little confusing. It's maybe even putting this in italics might help so that people kind of know a little bit more of um like i wasn't sure like am i reading a description from the point of view of a character or what this sounds almost more like a quote so i would if anything put this in italics um 
again, if you if you want to keep it hard hitting, don't change a thing. If you want to soften it up in the spirit of kind of trigger warnings, things like that, there would definitely be ways that you could convey the same information a little bit um, softer. And then this, I feel, gives a real good picture of what it is. I really like how amidst devastating circumstances, this book teaches you how to triumph when everything else is lost. Um, if anything, you could add, you know, an even stronger call to action to hear, you know, read the story of grit, courage, and love after death, and buy ravens and rainbows today. Something like that. You can end with a real strong call to action like that. Alrighty, so we are two minutes over the hour. Let me just skim comments super, super fast. Um, Tony says, does it matter if the guy is introduced first or not? I think convention is usually that the females introduced first. I don't have strong and hard opinions. I think especially for books like, um, I think it was this one where the guy's the one on the cover. People might expect, you know, the guy POE first. I don't think it really matters, but I know some people stick harder and faster to some of those tropes and roles. Okay, Julie, thank you, Julie, for having a more um, detailed answer, yeah. Tony tried both, doesn't think it matters. Pick one and stick with it for the series. Interesting, okay. <laughs> I love your noisy chickens, Julie. I miss having chickens. All right, all right. Um, Melanie, I can see if we're talking about this. Yeah, it's Facebook doesn't target people in grief mode. That would be a hard one. So in your case, targeting, finding audiences for this one, I wouldn't necessarily focus on people in grief, maybe people who are interested in spirituality, in psychology, in memoirs. Those would be some of the things that you could look into. Um, all righty, guys, so thank you super much. I do apologize, we went a couple minutes over, so apologize for going over. I also apologize if we rushed at the end and didn't get as in-depth into your blur, but this was hopefully useful information. Um, quick, quick housekeeping note. I'm going to say to you, goodbye, but Susan, if you want to jump on, I'm going to send you a new link, Susan, since you and I have something to chat about real quick. I will email you a new link so we can chat. And sorry, Tony, <laughs> I get your, your one name and your other name mixed up. Okay. Um, have a fabulous day, guys. Thanks for letting me take a look at your reviews. I do hope that that was helpful for you. Keep in touch uh, by email or in our Facebook group or in our Q&A thread with questions you've got. And we will talk to you all soon. Bye.